It is time for the woman factor, and it's interesting who my guest is for today. Now, uh, she's tasted a bit of, you know, different ministries from the tourism ministry. Now she is under the, um, you were in the ministry where the senior minister is, and so she is a minister of state. And a lot of people uh, once said that when she was reshuffled to the ministry of the senior minister actually um it was a demotion and so what does that mean and what does she think about it is it a totally different space for her and for a woman uh in politics what really has kept her going all this while honorable catherine afeku is here good morning to you and thank you so much for joining us how are you I'm doing great, Bella. It's so good to see you. It's good to see you so as good well. To see you. It's good to see you. And first of all, what I want to say is congratulations for even coming this far because as women, again, we all have to push each other up. And so I'm glad that you're in there. But politics, first of all, how did that happen? First, I have to congratulate you. Oh, thank you. This past <laughs> award. Thank you. You're also vibrant and strong, and thank we need you. to celebrate each other on a daily basis. Absolutely. Thank yes. you so much. Yes, but, but how did politics come Politics, uh, to me, it's a passion. It's a okay. calling. And if you do not have it in you, uh, it becomes a chore. Okay. Uh, this all started about 16 years ago. And just an abridged version. Yeah. I was in Atlanta, and I met a very powerful woman mm -hmm. who at that time was a deputy minister of information. Okay. Uh, Honorable Mrs. Abushi Saikofi. Mm. She inspired me and pulled me along. And I ended up in Ghana. Just like that? Yes, yes, yes. Prior she, to that, you didn't have any plans of no, getting into politics? No, I was not even thinking of relocating to Ghana. So what did she say? Uh, it, was a, it was, I think, a deeper sense of a call. She had actually invited me and gave me a job as the first female spokesperson on infrastructure in her ministry. Wow. And she insisted that she saw something in me that she felt strongly could help the Kofor administration. Did she tell you what she saw? I was the vibrant uh, and assertiveness, you know, because I was always outspoken, hmm. even in Atlanta. It was, it was something that I guess was a gift, but yeah. I didn't realize it at that time till she pulled it out of me. How so. long did it take you to accept that appointment? About six months. About six, six whole months. months? Yeah, because I was thinking about it. I had been out of the country for a while, you mm -hmm. know, as a diaspora. So, and you looked at it and you're like, why relocate married with kids, mm -hmm. with a career? And I've just had my MBA. I'm making some good salary. So, but she made a very poignant call. She okay. said, it is not about the salary. It's a call to serve your country. Okay. And she had lived in America for 15 years mm. and she came home. So her life was more like a mirror. She's like, if you come, you will not be following salary, but mm -hmm. you will have a deeper sense of meaning. Did you have to relocate with your family? Yes, or? I did. They, they came a year after. A year yes. after? Yes. They understood? They had to. <laughs> they had to because... Wow. It's, it's, about, it's, it's a very interesting story. My, my last one was a year old At that when time. we moved. Yes. And Were you not worried about the security of your family? Because, again, a lot of people get into politics and it's like your life is literally out there. No. And so security must be increased and must tighten. Um, I think that is what makes a lot of people not live their dreams. Mm. You have to risk in life to get the intrinsic rewards. Yeah. And it wasn't about our money or it wasn't about salary. It was about making a difference. Yeah. And I think we are Ghanaians to begin with. Uh, we lived here, went to school here, just mm -hmm. sojourned for higher education. So when you get an opportunity to serve, not many people get that chance to travel home to serve. What so, was it like working under Annabelle Oboshi Saikofi? I think it was exhilarating. It still is. Yeah? I still call her my boss. Okay. It still is. And we have, from time to time, our breakfast, and mm -hmm. she still mentors me. But to me... Uh, women need the helping hand. You need uh, another female in leadership to carry you along, to nudge you along. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's been an inspiring story that I always and will continue to tell. She gave me that opportunity to be who I am. Absolutely. Yes, a woman. A woman, indeed. So how long did it take for you to finally realize that, okay, I want to proceed in politics. I want to do a lot more than what I've been called to do. Uh, when I first came in, I was actually placed immediately mm. in the media arena. Mm -hmm. I was a spokesperson, as I told you. So you had to quickly learn yeah. about government infrastructure programs under President Kofor. Mm -hmm. So I was basically every day on air 
talking about government policies and programs, but with emphasis on infrastructure. Okay. So again, it was my mentor, my boss, mm -hmm. who actually uh, drummed it into me that why not go right. in for mm -hmm. the seat? Because mm -hmm. in Zima land, it's predominantly not with uh, the new patriotic party. Mm -hmm. uh, as you know the history, it's CPP and sometimes uh, the, the NDC. The NDC. Okay. So uh, humbly, I was the first ever mm -hmm. candidate to be fielded under the ticket of the new patriotic party out of the three in Zima seats. First really? time in 2008 and I won. And you won? Yes, yes. So that is something that I'm very, very proud of because mm. there were a lot of naysayers and it was based on facts they meant well. Mm -hmm. Since 1948, from the UGCC days, in Zima enclave did not uh, emerge as a, a UP friendly zone. Okay. But I was able to prove to the country that most of the voters at that time, 68%, were post-1966 mm -hmm. children and voters. So I was born after the coup d'etat. So most of us read about the history. So yeah. we didn't live it. So we are of a different era. Mm -hmm. And I was able to prove it and I won. I won handsomely the first time. Were you the first woman to ever win that seat? No, I was okay. the second, but the second. first on the UP tradition ticket. Okay. The first was uh, an NDC lady in 2000, mm. um, Madame Edith Hazel. Okay. But that was uh, also another political party that was known in the area. Mm. So uh, for me, that was a big, a big notch. Would you say then that she, as a woman, you were giving the opportunity to grow in your space? Because that's been a major challenge for a lot of women, from, for those of us who look from the outside. It looks as if the women are always called names. You know, there's always that sort of bullying in there. And so the men take a chunk of the cake and they leave the bits and pieces for the women to just clamber over. Is that something that you'd say happens? Uh, no, I think you have to fight for your own space. Nobody gives you. Uh, that's why it was a tough battle uh, when we were all talking about affirmative action. Yeah. Uh, we don't want pittance and we don't want crumbles. What we were advocating for was equal partnership. Mm -hmm. So no, there wasn't any leverage that oh, because you're a woman do it. No, you do this based on competence, your own acumen and qualities of leadership. Okay. And you are made in God's image and you have the qualifications from education, from community activism. So when you put yourself up for leadership in your community, your work, your character, your attitude must speak for you, not because of your gender. Mm -hmm. The gender comes on top as a leader with compassion, yeah. a mother with that kind of female attributes that makes you a, a better leader because you have empathy. Mm. It's natural with women. But it wasn't because it was given on a silver platter. No, okay. I was actually contested yeah. in 2008 with another female. Mm. And I've always been contested. But I urge a lot of women not to see themselves as not adequate. Mm -hmm. It's something that we need to ingrain in our younger uh, female aspirants that you can do it. Have we done enough of that? Uh, it's a work in progress. Okay. I think it's a work. And when we're able, hopefully the next session of parliament, we are able to make affirmative action an act. Mm -hmm. I think there'll be a lot of room, clauses that will support and encourage, one, mentorship, two, parties giving specific quotas for female candidates. Because mm -hmm. it's done in other jurisdictions. Yeah. How did Rwanda get there? So Ghana being uh, at the forefront of democracy, that... It can only be enacted as a law. Then the political parties will see it as mandatory. But the president gave an indication that it was a very critical act and he was going to ensure that it was passed. And yes. we're still here talking about well, it. Uh, we have, you know, a, female groups agitating for it and all that. Why has it taken so long? Do you know the secret? Look at what the numbers it? in Parliament. And when you put a law on the floor of the House, uh, you want everybody on board. When you have less than 50 women in a Parliament of 275, a law that promotes and support more female participation mm. in decision making naturally. We're not saying our male counterparts don't support, don't but support. naturally uh, the numbers don't give you the impetus that will make it a law. But this time around, I think it's gone far. Okay. Affirmative action will see the light of day. When is that happening? At uh, the next okay. session, I'm sure, next because session, yeah, okay. the next session, because a lot of work has been done. It's gone through a lot of uh, the parliamentary stages, mm. but until it becomes an act, it, it is not solid enough to enforce the regulations and the clauses that is incorporated in. What I'm really hopeful and looking to is 
when political parties will be enjoined to make quota an obligation. Are we deliberately delaying the passage of this act so that it will near elections that we can use that as, um, you know? I don't, I don't think so, don't because think? the parliamentary session is not that any bill can be mm. delayed. It's just a process. Now we, we, are, we are being recalled. Mm. We have two months, but you know yeah. there is a budget. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of other Auditor General's report. The other pressing parliamentary business that I'm part of the business committee, okay. so I know that will be conducted. But laws, I'm sure, will be for the next sitting in the next session but majority of the male on the gender committee mm -hmm. and our female as more as the caucuses we're very pro okay. uh, gender balance okay. and it can only happen when there is a law supporting it would you say you were devoted from the tourism ministry to the office <laughs> that's of the, the million minister? dollar question but as a matter of fact i'm so happy you give me this platform so we actually let the country understand and mm. appreciate the office of the senior minister yeah. in the hierarchy of governance you have the office of the president mm -hmm. you have the office of the vice president you have the office of the chief of staff mm. and you have the office of the senior minister it's the fourth most important office in the scheme of governance and hierarchy. So when you're placed there, I gave an example in Kumasi, in one of your sister stations. Mm -hmm. It's like being placed in an office where you're being groomed for a better position because okay. you learn so much and you're actually at the feet of wisdom. Uh, mm -hmm. my, my mentor, Honorable Nanaya Engineer Osaf Mafo, is a walking encyclopedia. Mm. He has a plethora of ideas, wisdom, strategy, and when you sit at the feet of such a great person, you can only listen, listen intently and learn. Mm. And the secret is all the sector ministers will have to come to him. So okay. if you are there, you pick a lot from all the other sectors, not just one sector. I mean, I learned a lot from tourism, but it was only one focus. Mm. Here you're dealing with public sector reforms, okay. you're dealing with Ghana Beyond Aid, you're dealing with all the other various ministries, uh, departments and agencies, mm. but people do not see the volume of work that comes through the office of the senior minister. And I think we need to also encourage others to appreciate what he does, why in the wisdom of the president he had to put a vibrant person mm. there to learn, mm -hmm. to assist and to also grow and to be groomed into better prospects. But already I'm actually people, grateful. You are. But I'm already people don't even grateful. think that we needed a senior minister. Because the, that's why I said because it's best for them to appreciate yeah. the load of work. Mm. They have no idea. So it's not no job idea. for the boys. And I'm no. not disrespecting the senior minister. He's no. definitely someone that we should all a respect. A big mentor. And so what it. I'm just saying is that people say that it's just the president giving jobs to his close allies? Absolutely not. And I'll give you, at least we are in a Khan cultural system, you always need an Abusia Penny. Mm. And in the scheme of governance, because we're Africans, when you look at his role, his stature, the wisdom, and the backing he gives to the governance structure, you'll be amazed how important that position is. And if you recall, I mean, you've been around, President Kufo had the late J.H. Mesa in that similar position. Mm. It is so needed and vital. Okay. I'm telling you, from what I've seen and what I've learned, I think... It should be a part of our governance process, mm -hmm. just like the Akan a traditional system where you need a leader, not shining too much, not overbearing, mm -hmm. but to give the best advice that can ever be given. He's very poised, very meticulous, and very sharp. He's an engineer. Okay. So, okay. no, there's a lot that goes on in that office, and mm -hmm. a lot of the ministers, sector ministers, can attest to it. But another group of people also think that if you were doing a great job, why were you taken out of the tourism ministry? Because you were, um, according to ASEPA, which is the Alliance for Social Equity and Public Accountability, they named you as the second best performing minister when you were at the Ministry of Tourism. Why then were you reshuffled? Precisely. That is what in politics, if you don't have a thick skin, you lose confidence. When you're doing very well, that's when you actually move to better prospects. Is that really the case? It is the case. Because for me, as a personal person, on my personal growth agenda, to me, I'm actually even more grateful to the present. Tourism was uh, kind of round. You were in Pigeon Hole. But at this portfolio, public sector, it encompasses every little process in governance, in reform, in mm. everything. But you have to have that kind of vision and the deeper thinking to realize that it is not a traditional role. You need the person with the capacity 
and the wherewithal to understand the wisdom mm. in the move. So it's not that you weren't doing a good job because a if lot of people If you're not doing a good job, you get you. sacked. If you're not doing a good job, you get sacked. Maybe you're a favorite and so the president didn't necessarily want <laughs> to let you go completely. So that's why he moved you to another ministry. No, Bella. See, that's where women, a lot of women don't speak up. Mm. It's absolutely no favoritism. If you're not competent, if you don't have what it takes, there's no business having you. So in the president's estimation, this was a portfolio that was good for a woman. Look at the top. How many females do you see? Mm. How many aspiring women in leadership do you see being groomed at the fourth most important office in our country? Maybe we're not supposed to talk about this mm. on television. <laughs> no, it's fine. But we need to get women to start believing in their capacity, that they're capable. Why not? We've had the first female chief of staff. Mm -hmm. Have you ever heard of a first female energy minister in Ghana, finance? Is it, is it because the women are not It is because capable? they are extremely capable. It's because, one, our confidence level. Two, we tend to believe others more than our inner voice. Mm. But those of us who have been through the mill, uh, these petty memories actually gives you strength. Because I know what the president saw in me. Mm. Combining that with member of parliament job, you must have the tenacity to do both. If you are so confident, why then are you being accused of going around with bodyguards who are assaulting uh, NDC party officials and, you know, assaulting media men and all that? Because those are the accusations that have been leveled against you. Bella, it's good we have this platform. Mm. I don't carry bodyguards around. And uh, greetings to a good friend of mine from your, uh, I think he's from your station uh, and uh, UTV, mm. of course. Okay. AGU. Uh, but I think it was uh, a miscommunication. I don't carry body rants around. As a, as a minister of state, I'm giving one police officer. Mm. There was an altercation at a court premise in my constituency. I was not even part of it. I was 20, 30 feet away from the scaffold. Mm. But because, again, I'm a female, I'm a member of parliament, I'm the leader in that area, it's easy to attach the name. But if you ask ZAM, the Western Regional GGA boss, if you ask those who were there, Catherine Afiku was not part of it. That's why I kept but quiet. But they asked you to come out and, and you know, There's speak no about point. It. Why should we do that? I mean, let me tell you, my dearest, uh, women with grace, composure, you don't jump at every controversy. Okay. You let it bring itself out. What transpired was a courthouse shuffle that absolutely had no, nothing to do with Catherine Afiku. And most of them are friends. They've come to my constituency two or three times. We've had the opportunity to talk. And we're working together because I was in media mm. for four years at mm. the Ministry of Information. So I know majority of them, but I'm happy you've given me a platform. So we disabuse the minds of other women in leadership that you don't need bodyguards to make you who you are. Mm. And you don't need to be intimidated by your male counterparts because you didn't speak out or shout at the time of an incident. Mm. Let poise, grace, and truth guide. And uh, to the credit of the media colleagues, uh, they have come to realize that it's nothing and much ado about nothing. We're working together. That's why I'm greeting uh, most of the people who came. But please encourage women. Mm those of us at this level, uh, to let our voices be heard because there's always another side to a story. Okay. And it's, it's trivia. It is not what it was embellished to, to be. be. No. And I'm here. I'm friends with them. I'm here with you. I'm on a platform. And I'll need them to propagate the good things we do in our various constituencies. Mm. You don't need fuckers with media people. Thank God I did not engage myself at the time of the... The yes, Bruhaha. Okay. Thank God. I'm all here right. with mm. you. And I greet all of them. They are <laughs> in my region, the Western Regional Correspondents from TV3 to UTV to the paperwork. All right. uh, we're here together. That we <laughs> need more women yeah. who are more assertive and can stand on their own to take political leadership. It is not for the select few, but it's for women with passion. Because if you see, uh, we are going to promote issues of minimal importance. I'd rather talk about the sea defense that's in my mm -hmm. constituency, the stadium that will help the youth, the town roads, and within three and a half years, developments that I've been able to lobby, one, as a result of being at the seat of government where okay. you sit with the most important person 
in governance structure. So you get to see a lot of projects being developed, being lobbied, and you are able to squeeze a few for your constituents. Out of 275 constituencies, mm -hmm. if you look at the plethora of projects that have been able through, of course, the, the big office mm. to move to my constituency. Even my male counterparts cannot. So women have to believe in their own capacities. It, it started with me, because okay. I do. Okay. I've been able to move an eight kilometer sea defense through a colleague minister, through the presidency to uh, my constituency. I see. A stadia, only 10 were being built in this country. One is in my constituency. All the town roads in the municipal is done. Okay. And they're going to do the bitumen. 109 kilometer road for the entire Jura section of my constituency is done. Mm. I've managed to pull a DVLA office hither to the Inzima entire enclave. You have to go to Takwa mm. or to Takradi to renew your license or even simple things that makes you compliant on the motorway. And, and that is a novelty. Okay. It's a woman who's pushing for these Koko district since independence there is cocoa in the Jura part of my constituency mm. and i've managed through the ceo Boyin, to put cocoa district so now the cocoa farmers will feel the impact of fertilizer distribution okay. uh, people who are going to help them like the extension workers and input to add their quota to the cocoa delivery mm. of our country so these are things that women in leadership have the capacity to lobby for more and we need to have more women mm. in that space. That's why we are lobbying you. No, no, but, no, please don't. <laughs> but we, we, tend to, we tend to minimize our impact in leadership. And we tend to lean towards issues that makes women recoil. So you need to grow into facing adversary, facing issues of controversy, mm -hmm. and come out with a win-win strategy, not to recoil and be shy. Is that, because, is that how uh, you have managed Well, that's, that's how I have believed that any female aspiring for leadership should have that thickness of skin. Yeah. That, you know, when you stand for truth, you should not be shaken. And you cannot be intimidated because you are a woman. No. Mm. You are made in the image of God. And if you have the capacity, serve yourself up for public service okay. and have the confidence and have the wherewithal that no matter what is thrown at you or with you, you will emerge victorious. It takes a learning process. It mm -hmm. doesn't happen overnight because uh, you, you need a sisterhood mm -hmm. for women to feel that we're not enemies and we are capable. We are very capable. But like I said, you have these issues and most women would rather avoid one, controversy, two, the exposure, and three, the unnecessary insults. Yeah. So a lot of intelligent professional women will not put themselves up for public service mm. because of these basic issues. How if I'd been a male, a male member of parliament, you know, with his bodyguard uh, enjoying in some scuffle, it would not even be mentioned. No, it would be. No, I'm saying it would not be mentioned as much. As as much yeah, mm. because they are medium and they will have to. But I'm saying the level of push will not happen. But see, as a woman in this arena, it will be pushed and pushed till you recoil. Yeah. No, not me. So the best thing you do is you find a way to Georgia and you let them know that, look, you're at fault. You actually placed me in the front page of a news article. Mm -hmm. And when you take time to read it, it actually had nothing to do with me. But majority of the women will recoil. That's why we need to stand up mm -hmm. and stand on the shoulders of our forebears who have been through it. There were only 10 women in parliament in 1960, only mm. 10. Mm. And they were not even elected. They were nominated. So you can see how far we've yeah, come. Yeah. And it's because of these hurdles, these impediments, that a lot of women will sit back. But I look at the, the work I've done mm -hmm. with pride. I look at the skills engage in lobbying and i look at how you can pull developments to your constituents and that's what keeps me going mm. so these minor setbacks will come but as a woman as a leader you must find a, a ground to bring people together so as i mentioned earlier uh the municipal chief executive yeah. met them you know he's male and they will listen to each other. It's, it's an ego thing. Yeah. But it's been resolved okay. as far as I'm concerned. But if I have to reach out to them, Bella, we use your platform. The Western Regional Media Team, who has been working with me for the last 16 years, you are most welcome to Inzima 
and if there is any punitive measures, we both have to share. Because you were at fault, and I may be at fault through my media friends and the security person who was with me. Mm. But definitely, I will not be coward into submission for what I've not done. Okay. We have to work this together as a team. Thank how, you. How are we growing the younger generation, especially the girls? And I'll talk about your uh, constituency because you are like the mother of the constituency. How are we ensuring that these girls don't grow up intimidated, don't grow up uh, thinking that the men are better than them? Because it's only, that's the only thing we can do to ensure that the generation coming up can also now come forward and also want to take up leadership positions like you are doing. Well, the first thing I did, because it's leadership by example, when I first entered the political arena, was to put 30 girls in uh, SHS. Back then, it wasn't free. It wasn't Thank free. God, yeah. it's free now. I put them through, paid for all of them. And about three weeks ago, uh, they all came back as a surprise visit to do testimonials, mm. how far their life. Some are uh, nurses, teachers. Okay. Uh, some are working at banks. And in 2008, if I had not come into their lives, they would have been wayward. Mm. And it was a very emotional session. I was sitting in a car listening to the uh, radio, mm -hmm. and most of them said they had not even met me before. We had wow. a panel that will do uh, the vetting. As a member of parliament, I insisted uh, we promote gender equity and there was a girls school axim senior high school mm -hmm. and i put them through from that time it was four years from mm -hmm. form one to form four made sure they were finished those who were going to training colleges i supported them wow. and they came back about 12 years ago this happened they came back on their own volition to surprise me and it was a very very teary session I that can imagine. and i met some of them for the first time because i wasn't part of the selection mm -hmm. process and it would surprise you that about half of them, their parents were not even uh, of my political party. Mm. They were not even supporting me. But their children went through school and they are now earning income to yeah. support the family. That tells you the power of womanhood, the female factor. That one girl has been able to, uh, one of them has actually paid for two of her siblings to finish school okay. as a result of her opportunity. That's lovely. And it is, it is inspiring. I, I told them we'll do a little documentary on their lives because this is what we want. And mm -hmm. in my own small way, and I actually had 100 people on the scholarship, but the 30 were all girls okay. and we pursued their future from day one to Not the until. end. Yeah, th those are the little examples of mentorship from a distance. Mm. And I I'm happy to play my role Absolutely. in bringing up uh, younger girls who will take up leadership position. But one thing, and I have to emphasize, is they cannot lose confidence in their own ability. That's the first drawback. Mm -hmm. Every woman will be intimidated. You're walking into parliament, you try to speak, and you'll be shut down. But mm -hmm. if you're not poised, if you don't have a mentor, that tells you to believe in, in yourself, yourself, believe in your own capacities, you will recoil. Absolutely, I can you imagine. Will recoil. How do we unite the women in politics, regardless of their party affiliations? How do we unite them so we can all fight to ensure that we have more women in Parliament? I can give you the inside info. For us in Parliament, the few that we have, we have the women caucus. It is not political. It's all women. Mm. So it's only us, the women in politics in Ghana that I think are doing that because I was at ECOWAS parliament, the, the Nigerian parliament, they don't have that. Mm. Kenya is even worse. They, it's very divisive. But in Ghana, the parliament women caucus is actually one body and we do everything together. Okay. So on that level, there is a, a strong sisterhood. Yes, we have our different political affiliations, but we tend to talk. We have friendship that goes beyond our political ideologies. Mm. And I think the more women we field as candidates to win and come in, not nominated, mm. but elective positions to come in into parliament, uh, it will be a better place. Because there are a lot of laws that are hanging, interstate secession, it is still hanging because the numbers, the women that have to fight for it, were not enough. Mm. And I, I foresee in the next decade having more women, at least up to 40% in parliament, okay. than a lot of female-oriented legislation will see the light of day. It is not any uh, thing against our male colleagues. It's just fact. It's just the way it is. Mm. It's, it's a world where you fight for your own cause. And if we are not many, you, you don't expect a man to pass an interstate succession bill yeah, when he's course. married to two or three. Mm -hmm. So these are issues that are germane to women's well-being. And you can only do that when there's a law.
So should we condemn women who openly fight, I mean, um, argue over politics, and it turns physical when we expect that these women should be united in order to fight for more women? I wouldn't use a harsh word like condemn. Mm. We always, you know, the work that we do, the positions that we have attained, and the wisdom over the years, you always have to see the two sides of the coin. But I would say statistically, women don't tend to get that violent. It's just little specks of spurts of issues that gets bloated and exaggerated. But overall, I would say that the women in the political arena tend to be more civil and cordial. It's very few. Once in a while, there is a spark. Mm -hmm. But I can assure you, our numbers are so small that if you move this, the whole world will hear. Mm. But the thousands of men having brawls, it's no news. So I would want to advocate that women are actually better in cooperating, in advocating, and in serving a unanimous or a united cause mm. for the betterment of our country. We don't fight like the men. 2020, Katharina Feku, are you winning? I am. I am. 110%. I know for a fact because of the work I have done and also the party support, it's unrivaled. And for the first time in the constituency's history, we are breaking the jinx of a one-term MP. Mm. It is because of the plethora of development that has engulfed the entire constituency. Half of the things you see being done, Bella, has not happened in 50 years. Mm. Roads, for example, in the entire Jira enclave of my constituency, this is the first time in the history of our country from Gold Coast before Gold Coast, that roads are being constructed. It's very emotional. Mm. And a lot of development. And also, I think, apart from development, what really is a, a deciding factor is the relationship with the constituents. Okay. It is the approach. I'm a hands-on person. I'm very uh, open. And people tend to feel comfortable. Because, mm. you know, it's a, it's a thing in women. We are nurturers. Mm. So you open up a lot. People come to you. As a leader, you are more a mother figure even if you're not with children because you place yourself in that position, in that position. people feel more comfortable yeah. uh, bringing their issues their challenges to you so i know for a fact that we're winning the seat for a fact because it is the people who are saying it it is not from me humbly because we have done this before mm. i was in parliament in 2008 i lost in 2012 and i made it back i was the only female that lost and returned immediately the entire country you can check your mm. statistics. Okay. Honorable Haji Alima Mahama lost two terms. She and fought came and came back. back. But for me, lost in 2012, went right back to work January 2013 mm. and worked hard to win and it. So again. it is the strength of a woman that needs to be exerted in our political arena. Mm. And we tend to shy away from our power, our inner strength. It is not aggression. It is God-given. Okay. We're powerful beings. So if you use that, Combine it with intelligence, humility, assertiveness. Yes, you can lead in this nation of ours. Politician. <laughs> Thank I'm you a so mother. much. I'm a mother. <laughs> Thank but you I'm, so I'm, much. I'm entreating you, Bella, to, to join oh, honorable, the bandwagon. Honorable uh -uh. Bella Mundi. Thank you very much. But I'll, I'll stay on the side and watch you do it. And I'll support you from that point. But thank you so much, Honorable <laughs> Catherine Afeku. She's the MP for Value Ajomoro, Jira constituency and got also right. i got it right right yay and also she is a minister at the office of the senior minister so thank you so much you most welcome i'm really morning. happy i came i'm glad thank you came you. as well and of course this has been the woman factor it happens every week right here on tv3 new day and so catch the same segment next week same time and tv3 continues right after this thank you